There's yep. Test one, two, three. Testing, testing. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to wait a couple of more minutes because people are filtering into the virtual version of this meeting. So we're going to give them a few more minutes to get settled in, and you as well. Uh, so if you need to take a break, take it now. We'll start in a we'll start in a couple of minutes, though.
All right. Thank you for taking time out of your evening this evening to come and take an interest in the affairs of your city. We're glad that you came. Um, public budget consultation wouldn't be much good without the public. Uh, so we appreciate you coming. There will be an opportunity uh, throughout the night to ask some questions, but we're going to have some presentations to begin with. Um, introductions are probably in order. My name is Tim. Uh, I work in Councillor Sean Devine's office in Ward 9. We have with us tonight uh, Councillor Devine from Ward 9, Councillor Lane Johnson from Ward 8. We're going in. Ah, fan club. Okay. All right. We didn't know it was a competition. And we've got Councillor Teresa Cavanaugh from Ward 7, of course. All right, we also have joining us tonight uh, the real hero of all of this process, Cyril Johnson from the Finance Department. Uh, think, well, I just called you Johnson by accident. Cyril Rogers from the Finance Department. Um, Cyril has done many of these over the last few nights, so uh, go easy on Cyril. Cyril will be providing us with an overview of the details of the budget tonight. We're going to sit and listen uh, to what he has to say so that we're all working from a common page. Um, we're going to hear some opening remarks from each of the councillors, and then we'll get to a question period. Okay, it should come quite quickly. We hope to get there by 7.30, uh, and we'll give you a good at least an hour to ask the questions you've got, try and get you good answers. But if we don't get to everything tonight, it's not over. I mean, you can obviously get in touch with any of your councillor's offices, ask the questions that you've got, try and get the answers that you need. It's very important that you understand what's happening with the budget um, and that you feel satisfied that you're getting the answers that you need. OK, so feel free to get in touch with any of the offices after this is over tonight. This is really just intended as a good opportunity to get good information uh, and hear what your fellow residents of the various wards have to say about it tonight as well. OK, uh, so we're going to begin with uh, some opening remarks, but we're going to start with Lane Johnson is going to provide us uh, with a land acknowledgement and start uh, with the opening remarks. Thank you very much, Tim. Welcome, everyone. Bienvenue à tous. Nous sommes ici dans la place de Ben Franklin, and uh, this is actually where my ward office is. It's tucked between the two double doors uh, going out towards the skating rink. Uh, so if you ever schedule a meeting with me, actually, Sean, you're there, too. That's our ward office over there. So welcome, welcome. Couple housekeeping items if you've never been here before. The washrooms are just down the hall towards the Meridian Theatres. So if you ever need to step out and use the washroom, there's also a water fountain there. Uh, so make yourself comfortable. Um, as Tim said, we're gonna be here for a couple hours and it's just my absolute pleasure to see all of you here tonight. Uh, I think we've got a great turnout actually for in-person and then we've got online. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to a few of my teammates as well. So over there in the uh, yellow sweater, we've got Heather. Heather lives in Crestview, so she is a, a resident of Ward 8 uh, with me. So I'm delighted for her expertise. Her parents also live in City View, so she's got a long-standing relationship with the ward, frighteningly so. Very, very much attention to detail. Uh, and then we have Daoud, who's in the back there, uh, who worked on some of our um, our uh, polling pieces that are going to come towards the end. Daoud is a student uh, at the University of Ottawa and is working on our community, our community animation strategy. So thank you both to the two of you for uh, your help putting this together tonight. Um, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement, and then I'll turn it to my two colleagues. Um, Tonight, we are. Uh, I wish to acknowledge that Ottawa is located on unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation, and we would like to honor the land and the peoples of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation who have lived on this territory for millennia, and whose culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. And I'll just give you a little uh, fun fact that I've learned about College Ward uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Did you know? that we have one of the largest uh, self-identifying Indigenous children populations in the city of Ottawa, children zero to 12. They call uh, College Ward home, and I did not know that. And so I'm very interested in, in uh, supporting uh, those communities over my time here. And again, I'm just so delighted to see so many friendly faces, and hopefully you'll still feel friendly after the budget. So uh, really nice to see you.
Great, thank you. Well, this is one of the first uh, in-person meetings uh, for um, for the budget in three years. <laughs> I, I I pulled out a notebook and um, and I I thought this is the notebook I used to bring to meetings. The last marking in it was March eleventh, twenty twenty. So uh, it's nice to be out again. Thank you. Um, so I brought some staff here tonight too. The person who organized everything, um, including setting up this meeting, coordinating with the other councillors and um, contacting staff is Georgie Gosham Hamer, who is right over there. Give her a hand because she did all this work to to make this happen tonight. And um, I also have in the audience uh, Marlene Legault, who um, is the person who answers the phone most of the time and does the casework and uh, keeps really busy on, uh, well, lately OC Transpo, whatever, you know. <laughs> she knows it all. And uh, and Sue Garvey, who also is, works in my office and helps me out on such files as affordable housing, which is very important to us. So um, we're thrilled to be here. Um, I don't have a word office. <laughs> I have coffee meetings. So uh, I actually... Uh, thought that was better and um, that that's worked out for for bay ward we we don't have a lot of public space that's an issue um so uh we decided to uh do it that way and meet people in the community and it's been going great so i'll hand it over to sean uh thank you Teresa. thank you lane and everybody else uh bonjour tout le monde uh, mon nom is sean devine je suis le conseiller de cap neuf hello everybody my name is sean devine i'm very Thrilled and proud to be the councillor for Ward Nine. Um, I'm. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit. Uh, the the, per the process we're going to go through tonight. This kind of community engagement is very near and dear to my heart, and uh, is is a is an integral part of how I hope to be a successful councillor in by listening to what is important to you and being transparent to you about what is important to me. Um, and obviously, um, how we spend our money is 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 at the center is part of that. Um, just a few little things. I think um, uh, you're, you're likely going to hear at some point tonight. Um, the process that we're having tonight, consultation for budget 2023, is an abnormally short budget consultation process because it's the process that comes just after an election year. Cyril is going to talk to you about how Pretty much as soon as we wrap this budget and approve it on March 1st, we're going to get right back on the horse and discuss the process for budget 2024. I know that many of my colleagues, including my colleagues here tonight, are looking forward to a much, much more thorough uh, budget process. Much of the budget that we're going to be uh, discussing uh, tonight and approving on March 1st is a budget that was set by, you know, uh, by directions uh, from the previous council. That's where we are right now. Um, just a few other things. Um, I, I just want, like I said, my goal is to be as transparent with you as possible. Probably during when we get to the question period is where I'll be giving you my perspectives and thoughts on various things, but I'll be transparent right now in that I certainly do have concerns about uh, this budget. I have concerns about uh, how our budget has been set. I, I worry about the future of um, budgets that are that are designed in this way. I'll be telling you later on about what my concerns concerns are. Um, they will likely re reflect some of yours. They might not. Um, and the last thing to mention that I forgot. Oh, yes. Um, what I'm really, really eager to have tonight is not just to hear your questions, to uh, to find out what are your budget needs and so forth, but the process we're going to go through at the end of the night, we're going to have a bit of a, a, a poll, a survey. Uh, what we are hoping to glean from that is not just what are your budget needs, but what are your what are the values that you hold dear when it comes to what you want this budget to do? I, I do believe that as a city, we see our city's values interpreted through the budget and so I'll be telling you about my values tonight, and I think we're all hoping to walk away with some clear information and data about your values. Um, that's it for me, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot more over the course of the next few hours. Thank you. Councillors, so we're going to hear now uh, from Cyril Rogers from the Finance Department. He's going to walk you through an overview of the budget for this year. Uh, so if you can lend Cyril your attention for the next 15 minutes or so, uh, then we'll be able to get to your questions. Cyril. Thank you. Can you guys hear me good? Perfect. Okay. So as I go through the slides, feel free to stop me at any time. 
Uh, ask questions. You don't have to wait till the end. I encourage the good dialogue. Ask the questions. I'll try and simplify as much as I can. It is a beast of a document. I'm glad a couple of counselors brought out the document. It's very thick. It's close. It's over a thousand pages now. Uh, there's a lot of detail in there. It's overwhelming if you don't understand it, and it's overwhelming to try and understand it. But I'm going to try and help you guys as much as I can. And I'm always open for questions. So next slide. So the budget, as uh, Councillor Devine said, this is a short cycle, but we literally live and breathe the, bu the budget 12 months a year. Uh, on March 2nd, when I get up, we're going to be right back into looking at the 2024 budget. So this is not your only opportunity to feed information to your councillors. Feed information to your councillors every day, every day of the year, because that's their opportunity to kind of filter that back up when we get into the deep dive pro the process and the build of the budget. So this is a very simple, high level way that we start our budget. Uh, one of the key things I like to highlight is we as a municipality, we need to have a balanced budget. So provincial, federal governments, they can balance for deficits, they can run deficits, municipalities can't. We, the rubber kind of hits the road at the municipality level, we cannot run a budget. So fundamentally, we need to make sure that all of our expenditures is funded by revenue sources, taxation, and some other sources, which I'll get into a little later. When we do start our budget, so we, I can forecast out now what 2024 looks like in terms of our salary costs. About 48 to 50% of our costs are related to salaries. It varies by service area. If you go through the budget, if you look at a service such as fire, EPS, paramedics, they're probably closer to 70, 80 percent uh, oh, <laughs> echo uh, salaries. But, but overall, you good? Sorry, right now. He does okay. that every council meeting, every single Yes, he month. does. So overall, about 50 percent of our costs is salary related. We are a union environment. We are bounded by collective agreements. So we need to adhere to those uh, annual increases, annual increments as per the negotiated collective agreements. We look at growth. So across the city, the city is growing. From an infrastructure perspective, I'll speak to a little later, development charges funds the actual growth in terms of the capital infrastructure, but we also have growth, and I'll speak to a little later as well, what assessment growth is. And of course, we always try and manage our, our existing assets to make sure we maintain to a good state of repair. Cyril, sorry, can I interrupt? That that microphone is is unidirectional, so you kind of have to point it, yeah. it to your mouth. Okay. Yeah, that, that'll make a big difference. Like Thank you. Karaoke. Uh, then we kind of get into the other side of the equation where we always look for efficiencies. Uh, this budget does have uh, over $50 million worth of efficiencies identified. We, we pride ourselves in terms of always looking to do things more efficient, continuous improvement. Uh, user fees and revenues. So user fees such as if you, if you have a transit ridership, that's a user fee. Uh, if you take part of recreational programs, swimming lessons, et cetera, that's user fees. So that's another source of income that kind of comes into the city outside of the property taxes. And then, as I mentioned before, taxes from new assessments. And that's really, really simply a house that's going to pay pay taxes in 23 that didn't exist in 2022. That's assessment growth. So that's a new house that kind of came on, on, on our tax roll. So that's incremental new revenue because there's a net new house in 2023 versus 2022. Next slide. There we go. So the 2023 budget, 4.5 billion. This is basically a breakdown of where that money goes allocated by services. Uh, again, if we were to go down to every service level that's in the budget book, that donut would be extremely big and really crowded. So we kind of try and summarize it a little bit. So when you look at one of the biggest, biggest drivers of our budget is community social services. I'll speak to it on the next slide. The majority of that, 80 plus percent of that funding is coming from the province. This is for your long term care, child care, et cetera. So that money that comes in is needs to be invested into those programs. So we can't take money from here and invest somewhere else. Same as transit. Uh, there is a transit tax levy. So the, the, tra the transit taxes and the transit fares that needs to support transit. We can't take transit fares and invest in another program. Similar to Ottawa Police Services. They have their own tax levy. They are governed by the Police Services Act and they have their own governance board. So we can't take money from police services. Like council doesn't have the authority to take money from police services and put somewhere else. 
uh, capital formation, that's basically cash that we take from our operating and put into our capital infrastructure. And then the last one I want to highlight is up top, general government, 5.4%. That's your HR, IT, finance, et cetera. I always say this at every consultation, that's really lean. Anyone that does any benchmarking or indices in, in terms of other public sectors or other private industry, typically administration is in the 10, 15% range. So that's a pretty lean uh, administrative function for the city as a whole. Next slide. How do we pay for that? So about 50% payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, that What that is is basically federal government's buildings, crown corps, they don't get a formal tax bill. What they have per legislation is what we call PILTS, which is payment in lieu of taxes. So really that plus your property tax, that's about 50% of the revenue that kind of comes in to fund the $4.5 billion budget. The, the, the billion dollars for federal provincial funding, that's largely related to community social services. So that's where you see the long-term care, childcare, et cetera, money coming in. The fees, services, and charges, so that would be your water bill, your wastewater bill, your, your transit fare ridership, uh, your swimming lessons, your skating lessons, et cetera. Anything that you pay for a fee that the city provides outside of your tax bill kind of flows through there. Next slide. Capital program. So for 2023, draft capital budget is a billion dollars, just over a billion dollars. Uh, where does that money go? Largely in these two buckets right here. So you're, you're drinking wastewater and stormwater. Again, that's your infrastructure for your pipes, the water to come into your house, the water that leaves your house. Integrated roads and wastewater. What that is is basically if we need to replace a pipe on Constellation Drive, you got to dig that road up to get to the pipe. So the, the integrated roads is the tax dollars pays for the road repair then the rate dollar pays for the pipe below the road. So if we got to tear up the road, obviously we got to repair the road. So that's why we call it integrated because it truly is integrated with the pipes below. The other big ticket item for uh, capital would be transit. Of course, bus, new buses, bus replacement, uh, that infrastructure. And then the next biggest one would be transportation services. So that's where you see fleet for the city operations, roads resurfacing, sidewalks, pathways, et cetera. Next slide. How do we pay for that? Uh, largest share, 63% reserves. That's really our cash account. So you kind of treat it as your checking account. That's cash that we have aside that we fund from operating. You saw on the previous slide, it was over 400 million in 2023. Then there's other funding sources that kind of comes through our reserves that we kind of fund into the capital program. Then the next two biggest pieces is debt. Uh, so in 2023, that's $230 million. From a debt perspective, there's a couple of legislations in place in terms of provincial legislation. Municipalities cannot go over a threshold of 25%. Basically, 25% of the taxation revenue that we collect, that's the maximum level we can allocate to debt. City Council, they brought that down to 7.5%. But provincially, it's 25. They brought it down to 7.5. What that means is that's a really tight, uh, fiscally responsible thing to do is my opinion. We at the city were below 4%. So we don't carry a lot of debt from our own tax sources. The majority of the debt that we do have on our books is funded through either development charge debt, federal gas tax debt, or other sources of debt that's not on the tax burden. The other big component is development charges. So again, new subdivisions, new housing, they pay development charges. We take that funding and that's allocated to roads, transit, et cetera, as per the DC background study. Next slide. This is kind of a kind of a depiction in terms of what we call discretionary budget versus non-discretionary budget. And what do we mean by that? As I talked about earlier, like when you look at the non-discretionary here, long-term care, public health, et cetera, those programs where the province is funding we can't really touch that because a long-term care dollar that comes from the province needs to be invested into a long-term care uh, service. So we really we have limited control over that. When we go over to the police budget, again, city council has minimal to no control over the police budget. When you look at programs with services and standards, if I take a dollar away from the fire budget, 
likely going to impact the number of firefighters on the road. So it really impacts the services and their service response time. When you go up to the direct service programs, if I take funding away from recreational programs, it means they don't have a lifeguard or they don't have a skating instructor. So it's really tied to a service and a program that they offer. And kind of brings us back to that support service, which is the administrative functions, where it's a very small budget in terms of taking money away from. And of course, you still need the IT, the finance, HR departments to support the organization. Next slide. Uh, budget direction. So as Councillor Devine mentioned, this is a tight cycle. Uh, normally, we typically do our directions usually in the June time frame, table a budget early November, and then we adopt in December. Because of the tight time, time, time frame in terms of when council was elected and sworn in, it really is an accelerated cycle. Budget directions was approved in December. Basically, council gave the direction to the finance team to go build the budget. The budget is directly built based on directions from council and the various reports that we have. So one of the, the key points is the tax levy increase that allows me to kind of formulate and, and calculate how much new revenue is going to come in. Assessment growth, 2.2%. Uh, that is one of the largest assessment growths that the city has seen, uh, which is in 2022. The rate program, the rate program is directly built based on the rate long range financial plan, which was approved back in 2018. Then we have all these other frameworks, policies, reports. So everything we do, we, we meet those commitments in terms of you know, the, the tax long range financial plan, our fiscal framework, housing long range, long range financial plan, et cetera. Next slide. So a little bit of a timeline. Directions report went in December 7, approved December 14. Uh, throughout the month of January, public consultation started with counselors, and then budget was tabled. That document was tabled on February 1st. Uh, next slide, I'll show you the long list of committee meetings. The, the, the counselor consulta uh, consultation has really picked up in the last two weeks. There's been committee meetings every, every week since February 1st. There's two next week, uh, audit committee tomorrow, and then one on the 28th for community social services. And then finally, budget adoption on March 1st. Next. <laughs> I'm getting there. Uh, so if you look there, uh, that's the schedule. So for what it's worth, I've been at every one of those meetings to date. <laughs> and what's not there is I'm here tonight. I was somewhere else last night. I was somewhere else Monday night. So it, it is a really jam-packed schedule. It's a little bit crazy. Uh, people, uh, residents can come out and speak to any item on that committee so if you do have a concern from a from a transit perspective you go to transit commission if you have a concern from a roads or anything transportation related you go to transportation committee housing and planning was on when yesterday right yesterday uh, so again if you need to, if you want to speak to a budget item you can come to the committee where that budget is reflected next slide Lastly, these are the different avenues for input. Uh, what I tell everybody, I encourage use your counselors as your avenue every day of the year for input. It's not like we're it's not like we're kind of going to close the books now and we don't look at the budget again until June, July, September. Is always opportunity for input. One thing that we will be doing effective, you know, right after budget adoption, term of council priorities will be be. Uh, brought together so all the counselors the mayor's office etc they come together they work over the a month two months three months they build the strategic term of council priorities that will be done before the 2024 budget so it helps inform the 2024 budget typically our our directions report for the budget would go in june sometimes it slides to september depending on the legislative agenda and then normally back into the november december time frame for these types of deep dive uh, consultations and that concludes presentation. Thank you very much, Cyril. Uh, it's a lot to cover, as you may gather. Um, and we're going to try and cover more by taking your questions. Uh, see if there are things that you have specific things you'd like to ask. Uh, you can ask it of your counselors. You can ask it of Cyril. Uh, if you're not sure who to ask, we'll figure out who to direct it to, but please feel free. Um, so Dawood has a microphone 
So what's going to happen is if you want to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand uh, and we'll get Dawood to come to you rather than getting you to queue up. So if you've got a question, I see one in the back row. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to remember. All right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, please go right ahead. Non-governmental non international panel on climate change reports show that there is no climate change, no climate emergency. Since 1880, global average temperature has risen about a degree Celsius. I'm going to ask you to hold for a second. This is an opportunity to ask questions about the budget. So yes, OK, I'll come what you're to that. What you're doing is you're helping me. You have just reminded me of something that I need to remind everyone of. But it's really important that you ask the question. Um, okay. The place for speeches is not tonight. Uh, but what we need is good questions so that you can get good answers. So feel free if you have a question. Uh, only if it's absolutely necessary to ask the question. We'll, we'll I'll, see. I'll cut it short. The best database in the world for the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration Extreme Weather Records for U.S. states shows zero extreme weather records for 2022. There are four times more polar bears now than in 1950. There is more coral on the Great Barrier Reef than ever measured before. Sea level rise is continuing at about the same slow rise centuries. Okay, Where okay. Is I'm this still not hearing a question. Here. Where is this emergency that is worth Ottawa ends spending tens of billions of dollars to stop an emergency crisis that data does not reflect? Okay, thank you for the question. Who would like to take on this question? Why is the city of one one moment? That's okay. Hang on. Yeah, we're quite happy to take the question. We're quite happy to take the question. Who would like to tackle that? Who would like to tackle that? Hello. I'm not altogether sure what the question was. No, 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 it's okay. My understanding of the question is, yes. why is Ottawa dedicating budget funds yep. to fighting? Yeah, yeah, we can talk about the number, but why are we dedicating budget funds uh, to fighting a climate emergency that some people are in doubt of. Okay. Well, I mean, I think we're dedicating many, many you know, envelopes of funding to many areas of concern across this budget. And the collective will of the people who are studying the budget have identified areas of concern of which climate mitigation is one of them. Um, and so I, 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 I'm no expert, but I think most experts are saying that there is a need for us to invest in climate mitigation strategies. And so I think that's why it's in the budget. And most people uh, that I speak to are glad that these investments are being made. Well, you're doing it right now, which I think is great. Uh, you're challenging that belief. And so we're going to be walking away from this, taking these kinds of concerns. And I am more than happy to take a concern from a citizen, from a resident, um, because there's going to be different people here tonight that want our money to be spent in a different way. And I'm certainly going to be recording this, and I'm going to be bringing this back. And if what I hear from you represents the collective will, for example, of the entire ward that I serve, if the majority of Ward 9 feels that we shouldn't be making these kind of investments, then I certainly take that into concern. I don't anticipate that that's what's going to happen, though. Um, I anticipate that what you're speaking now is a minority voice here. I respect the fact... Oh, no. I'm no, not no, no, you. I you didn't say anything. No, I didn't. Not you. I mean, okay. Okay, I'm going to ask. I'm okay. going to ask that you please so all take a I seat. You've got a chance to ask your question. There are over a hundred people in this meeting, and many of them would like to ask their own questions. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, we're gonna go on the honor system of who I said number two was. I'm pretty sure you were back in this section. So number two. Sorry, if I may quickly, Tim, yeah. um, we're just gonna alternate between in-person and online questions. Let's let's do a couple of questions in the room. I agree, yeah. And then a couple yeah, of questions fine. online. Sure. Okay. Great. Right here in the middle of the, the middle row. Thank you. I guess uh, my question is appropriate right after um, the person here who just asked the question. And I heard your answer with regards to climate change. Uh, you mentioned that you're considering mitigation uh, strategies. I think it's one uh, thing to consider mitigation on climate versus the alarmist discourse that does not seem to be supported by science, according to, I think, many people who may have looked into it, including myself. So my question to you is, before spending millions of dollars on your climate plans, who are the experts on both sides of the climate debate will you bring in for open public hearings to ensure that your city policies are based on the best available science? There are many experts across Canada who say that the UN reports the city is relying on, i.e. the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, are seriously flawed. So who are these experts that you will be bringing in to make sure that the policies that are made in Ottawa are based on science? Thank you. And just so you know, like one thing that I want to do, like. I'm going to ask everyone to respect everyone. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not helping us. So we'll just have to let. Thank you. Be calm. We're going to ask everyone to just simply ask questions of the councillors and of Cyril and respect the answers and try to respect one another, please. OK, thank you very much. So just so you know, like just some of the things that I want to see, you know, done in the city as a means of um, like uh, my general mission statement um, is our city's growing at an alarming, not an alarming rate. Our city's growing quite, you know, there's, there's a lot of people, our city's growing. Cities across the world are growing, population is growing. And what I wanna do is I wanna help manage that growth in a way that is as sustainable, as responsible, as effective, as forward thinking, and as just as possible. When it comes to, for example, climate change, a few things that I wanna do, I would love to plant a lot more trees. I saw my neighborhood, I saw entire neighborhoods of Ottawa lose tons and tons of trees. When you lose trees, you lose a means of controlling uh, carbon monoxide and we just release more and more into the air. When we lose trees, we have heat islands that become more and more uh, risky to those who live by them. And so I don't really need, no, I, on that element, I think the science is there. Planting trees is a good thing. I think most people would support the fact that if I want to plant trees as a means of trying to, you know, ensure public safety from the risks of what happens when we don't have trees, that's that's a largely good thing. Another thing that I want to do is I would love to do whatever I can to try to use a budget and to use the tools that I have and the resources I have to get more people out there walking and riding bikes. You might not see it that way, but to me, that's all a climate mitigation thing. So oftentimes when I talk about things I want to do for climate mitigation, it's just ways to steer behavior into, in, into, into different ways of doing things that don't have as much, for example, greenhouse gas uh, impact in our city or that prevent our city from becoming too hot. A lot of these things are pretty accepted uh, practice. And I appreciate the fact that you're bringing the concern. Um, I don't have a summary or a conclusion, but thank you. Yeah, and I'm Again, I'm going to ask you not to shout things out from the audience, or I am going to ask you to leave. Understand. This is, we are attempting to answer the questions. You you have elected, you have elected officials in front of you who have been voted into office, who are accessible to you. You can send letters, you can set meetings, but what this is, is a open community conversation and you're getting a chance to ask the questions, right? So you have to, you have to, you have to listen to the responses and decide whether you like them or not. Okay, uh, you've asked a question. <laughs> yes, 
Uh, we're going to go to two questions online and then I'm going to come back to you. Well, one moment. We're going to go to two questions online and then I'll come back to you. OK, so we have a couple hands in the online meeting. I'm going to enable Rachel. Uh, Rachel, if you'd like to ask your question, you may go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Hi. Uh, good evening. Um, this is not about climate change question. This is just something to bring up. We have a beautiful city. The city is gorgeous. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't see the beauty of it. So the question is, who or where do I start asking question about lighting? Just because it's not really lit up when you drive at night, just different parts of the city. I mean, I know downtown is lit, but out like, let's say Alta Vista is so dark. Um, just, you know, just how do I start this conversation? Who do I ask? What's the department? Like, you know what I mean? Just to kind of start asking those questions because the city deserves to be seen. It's really pretty. All right. You seem to have struck a chord with Councillor Johnson. So yeah, I, I had to have a giggle because uh, while I was campaigning, uh, you would try even in the middle of summer to get through some of the parts of Crestview and City View before it became completely pitch black and people don't like to answer their doors at the best of times, you know, but definitely not when it's pitch black at night. And and we do have a challenge in some of our our wards here. Um, uh, a lot of our neighborhoods were designed as part of uh, uh, the former city of Nepean. And uh, through that, we we had a different set of uh, uh, expectations when it came to our expenditures and our priorities. And uh, and so we do have fewer uh, street lights and sidewalks often uh, for the same reason. And it is a challenge because we're in a bit of a pinch um, when it comes to how we're going to put those investments in. The cheapest way to do it is in those integrated road. You know, when Cyril was talking about the integrated road structures, uh, wastewater, that's the cheapest way to get your street lights. That's the cheapest way to get your sidewalks. Well, did you know that in the outer urban wards like College Ward, like Bay Ward, uh, like Knoxdale, Merrillville, our infrastructure is not as old as the downtown core. Uh, so our pipes aren't made out of wood. So you'll see in the 2023 budget, we are not getting really any integrated uh, projects that will allow for those roads to come up and those installations to be made. Um, certainly not in Ward 8 anyway. Maybe you guys are getting some. Are you getting one? We just... We just had a major uh, trunk a storm sewer renewal, but it's for most of the city. Right. It just happens to go through Bay. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So so some of those repairs will come to us, um, but it is a challenge when we don't have those larger projects. And then, of course, the newer uh, developments have a different set of standards uh, for those designs. So we're kind of in an in-between state. So it's going to have to take a lot of political will to look at those policies that exempt us from getting those kinds of interventions and making an argument uh, to to get those investments when we're not seeing the road renewal. It's going to be tricky, but I really appreciate your position and I and I absolutely validate it. Hey, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. You're welcome. All right, we have one more question from online and then we'll return to the room. For those who are in the room, there are about this many people also online, so we're going to be flipping back and forth. OK, Jonathan, if you'd like to ask your question, please go ahead and you can unmute. Thank you very much. Um, my question is a general one to the three councillors, but potentially focus more towards Councillor Kavanaugh. So I will start with that. Um, the specific question is the following. Given that there is a fair bit of media reporting that the budget is uh, proceeding with a tens of millions of dollar cut in funding towards OC Transpo, how is this going to work to restore uh, public trust and transit? The reason I specifically bring it up, I have a friend who has disability issues who lives near Carlingwood. So she should be able to get downtown on a core route bus on a daily basis. At this point, she is getting out of bed two hours earlier so that she'll be at the bus stop two hours ahead of what would normally be a typical transit time in order to hope that a bus will show up so that she gets downtown to her employment before the start time of her job. This is not the type of thing that will encourage people to use transit. So what can be done by you three councillors to recognize that transit service in these three wards is 
bluntly insufficient and with transit co uh, budget cuts is likely to get worse. Thank you. All right, I believe Councillor Kavanaugh yeah. is going to jump in and answer that yeah. question. No, thank you. Um, we're quite aware of it. Um, we get uh, concerns all the time. Uh, my office is fielding them with very similar uh, problems of waiting for buses that don't come, sometimes uh, buses that skip certain areas just to keep up on their schedule. There, there is a problem, a major problem. Um, if, if they put one word to it of what people are upset about, it's there's the lack of reliability. They cannot count on the bus. And, um, and I know we have our problem with the trains, but actually the biggest problem is with the reliability of bus service. And uh, they're talking about um, reorganizing it. And I'm getting concerned because that sounds like code word for cuts. And there is no doubt that there will be cuts because of the, the budget. The budget is already saying that. So uh, we, we do have a major concern on our hands. We're trying to get people out of cars. I'm sorry, but we are. And um, we're trying to get people to use more transit. And if we're going to do that, it has to be absolutely reliable. So I'm on the same page as you. Um, I've, I've, I'm witnessing it. I'm seeing it in our own community. And um, we have to do better. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to return to the room. I believe I promised you would go next. There you, oh, there you go. For the people online, that's okay. Just speak Thank into you. it. I'd yeah. like to know if our council in the city of Ottawa would ever take a vote about the strong mayor situation, undemocratic situation that exists right now. And I, because I'd love to know who would vote for it and definitely who wouldn't. I'm into democracy. And I can I just say one more thing? In 1978, when we attended meetings in this neighborhood with to do to do with rapid transit, we asked for a grid system. At the third meeting, one gentleman stood up and said, why did you bother having these meetings when you were never going to listen to us in the first place? I just want to put that out there so that these meetings mean something. Thank you. Well, I just want to let you know that I put forward a motion to make the mayor say that he would never use the strong mayor powers. And he agreed to it and it went through unanimously. So, so we took care of that. Me? Okay. Sure now, yeah. All right. Um, well, so question for the councillors. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, taking the time to come out. Um, I will say that I was shocked yesterday because I attended a, a police board uh, audit committee meeting and I had sent an email about it uh, on Monday and as well today. And so I was, well, the question is going to be, um, whether you would jointly <laughs> or individually bring a motion to have a joint uh, business plan for the uh, Ottawa police before the budget passes. So that's the question, but I'll tell you why, why, why the question. I was shocked at the meeting. We had kind of rushed through a budget. There's a regulation that says the Ottawa police has to have a business plan once every three years. They currently have no business plan. So by law, and I can assure you that Mr. Ro Mr. Cyril would not be able to contradict me, if this were a judicial review, but the fact that they've broken that regulation, the budget itself will be struck down because the purpose of the business plan is to inform the budget. So without a, uh, a business plan, you can't have a budget. Now within the same regulation, it says that council can choose to have a joint business plan with the OPSB. So the reason for my shock is that I was at a meeting yesterday. I hear the chief complaining that where's the urgency for alternative service delivery? I hear Councillor Curry saying the same thing. In fact, she said the community should be going after council for not funding you know, the, the lack of. I hear Councillor Carr complaining why is police doing traffic duty? So I look at all the OPSB members. I look at Councillor Brockington who said, oh, OPS priorities are not reflecting the community's priorities, and he wants to have a joint core protocol and establishment 
all those priorities and objectives and how to measure them. So, but the regulation already says the things they're complaining about should happen. So that's why I started with my question. Would you be willing, and this is, I just want you to be sure that there's a regulation that says you have a right to do what I'm asking you to do. So would you be willing to bring a motion saying, let's have a joint emergency business plan for the OPS so that we can decide how to prioritize um, the budget? Thank you. We can look into it, but uh, the police budget is totally separate. It has it's a separate category. So, unfortunately, I don't think it's possible. But we'll we'll certainly inquire about it. I, I think we have expertise here in terms of what can and can't be done. So we'll check in on that. Yeah. So for full transparency, I used to be the CFO at Ottawa Police uh, from July of 2020 to November of 2021. So I joined the city in 2013. Uh, 2020, I moved over to Ottawa Police and I came back to the city in November of 2021. So, and I'm not I'm not a politician, so I'm not going to get into the waters of politics, but from a Police Services Act, you are correct. There's supposed to be a, the Ottawa Police Services Board should be putting forward a business plan uh, strategy. Uh, I'm not going to make excuses that was delayed while I was there. It never got completed. I've left and move on, so I can't really speak to what's been done since I've left. But councillor is right. City Council as a whole does have limited authority in terms of what they can direct or really direct because they can influence. So, you know, council can put a motion forward or recommend a motion to the Ottawa Police Services Board they can choose to accept that or they can choose not to accept that but there is limitations in terms of what council can do in terms of you know they can always recommend or suggest but the board ultimately would have to make that decision to do that so so council so council cannot impose on OPSB and OPSB cannot impose. And within the regulation, it says objectives, priorities, how we do police. Uh, and then it talks about resource planning. So what I'm simply telling you is that the budget, once every three years, the OPS budget, Ontario has given council veto power to negotiate that budget with the OPSB. And because it has not been done, you cannot pass a budget because whatever arguments I'm hearing yesterday, they have an impact on other city committees, like social services, like housing, like planning. They have an extensive like, audit committee. So I, don't just, I just don't see how when members of the OPSB and the chief are crying out, Toronto has an $11 million pilot today. And Ottawa doesn't. And the chief is saying this is urgent. And council should have a say. That's my point. All right. We have another question from online. Yeah. Yes, of course you can. You like it? Okay. So, uh, Kit, if you'd like to go ahead, uh, you can unmute and ask a question. All right, thank you very much. Um, so my question is regarding um, the uh, 15 million, 15.2 million budget increase for the police. I heard from the uh, presentation today that the city council has limited to no uh, authority to make any changes on um, what the police budget might be. I'm wondering who I might contact regarding that. I'm, find it quite concerning that such a large amount of money is being directed towards the uh, police budget at, at a time whenever uh, the city is currently going through an affordability crisis. And I would think that the, uh, the uh, funds that are being given to the police might be better uh, served elsewhere. Yeah. Um 
The way it works is um, the police decide their own budget, and Cyril uh. will, has has some expert on that. But um, in terms of uh, the vote, it comes to council. So council council votes on the budget. Now, if they voted against it, they the police would have to go back to the drawing board and uh, and do something. But um, that hasn't happened over the many years I've seen. So, but uh, that that is our power, is our vote. Um, otherwise, you go directly to the police board, which many people have done in terms of delegations to raise your concerns. And I and I know there is a lot out there for sure, and I share them, especially in terms of uh, using money for um, more preventative measures and uh, working on mental health issues. I think that's probably the biggest uh, factor that we see that needs improvement. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Eileen, if you'd like to ask your question, you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, thanks very much for hosting this meeting. I'm sure you've been working all day and all uh, all night in some certain circumstances for the budget, given the compressed timeline. So thank you again for for hosting this meeting. I do want to ask a question about the allocation for affordable ho housing in the budget. I've asked this question in other fora. Um, I'd like to take a different tact uh, to the extent that according to previous public opinion polls, there is very strong support for uh, ending chronic homelessness in Ottawa. Uh, there was a public opinion poll last year um, saying that 83% of respondents said it should be an urgent goal to end homelessness in Ottawa. 90% uh, said that they would support new affordable housing in Ottawa. Um, there was a previous poll released three years ago saying that homelessness should be the number one concern of municipal council. I'm just wondering why funds for new affordable housing builds have not increased for the past five years since those funds were introduced in 2019. I know it's in the 10 year plan, but the result is funds that don't grow to meet the need for things like inflation, more people who require those services. Basically, that's effectively a cutback. So I'm just wondering if council members can respond to that. Thank you again for the meeting. Okay, hey, Councillor Kavanaugh is going to take on your question. Thank you very much, Aileen. Um, I agree with you. The 15 million is a static number. It's the same amount as 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 you said uh, for many years, and um, everybody knows that costs have gone way up. Whether it's supply, labor, if you can get things done, um, building affordable housing is built just like building anything else. It it's very expensive. Um, uh, many of you don't know this, but I'm the chair of Ottawa Community Housing. Ottawa Community Housing is uh, solely owned by the, uh, it's a corporation, and it's solely owned by the City of Ottawa. And our mission is affordable housing. We already have uh, 15,000 units right now, and we need a lot more. We also have a waiting list of 12,000. So 15 million doesn't cut it. To, to get rid of that wait list, get rid of homelessness. And I know how severe it is. Um, everyone sees it. I think everyone has seen homeless people. They've, they've seen that it's grown. This is, this is an emergency. It truly is. And we voted on that. We voted to say it was an emergency, yet we're not putting the funds to it. I mean, the fact that we have an increase in the budget of up to 2.5%, but we keep the amount for affordable housing static, I think that's a, a real concern. This should be our number one priority. And the irony is, is it actually saves money. When you put people in homes, you're not paying for all the expenses of people who need so many other things because they're living on the streets. You don't have to have all the services because <laughs> we end up using police and 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 health services etc people need homes that's that's just the humanity that we should be dealing with all right thank you councillor kavanaugh councillor devine 
Um, just briefly, I think, uh, uh, so thank you, Aileen, for asking the question. And for anybody in the audience, either in person or online, um, I think you can feel confident that at least with the three counselors you have up here, uh, we, we share that concern. Um, I, I love hearing in the, in the framing of your question, Aileen, that you're referring to the clear evidence of the majority of Ottawa residents seeing this as a concern. That's the kind of will of the room that I like to walk away with um, so that I know that there's a concentrated desire for that kind of that kind of action. Soon after this process for the 2023 budget ends, we go into the process for not just the 2024 budget, but we go into the process for what we call our term of council priorities, where all councillors are basically going to just go through a a process, a strategic planning process, as it were, where we identify what our priorities are for not just this budget year and next budget year, but for the term of council. And there's a lot of rumbling already around the council table that housing should be, you know, at the top of the list, if not at the top of the list. Um, so there's there's a lot of collective will behind that. And I hope that will translates into more than a than a static number year after year, which is uh, a slap in the face in a way. Councillor Johnson. I just wanted to offer a bit by way of um, uh, my my learning of, of how this how this all comes to pass as a new councillor. So if you see something in the budget that you're not uh, that you'd like to create, you know, you'd like to invest more in, uh, you have to come up with an offset. So you have to find the money somewhere else and you have to be able to convince whoever owns that money that they should give it to you instead. And then you're able to bring that suggestion to committee and then that suggestion gets debated at committee and gets voted on by your peers. So you not only have to pass the, the test of finding money somewhere else and putting it wh where you care about, but then you also have to show up at committee in a manner that convinces all your peers that may think differently from you that they should also agree with this. So it's it's a very it's a very trying process and it should be because the priorities are are different for everyone. So we do have an opportunity at council which is on March 1st to move a motion to find more money for things we care about that don't have an offset. But that's kind of less palatable to a lot of people, right? Because you're trying to find money out of nowhere or you borrow from reserves or whatever the case may be. And it's just a little bit less credible. It's not necessarily impossible, but it is it is probably more convincing to find an offset. So we are, as councillors, working very hard to find the offset to bump affordable housing between now and March 1st. It has been a challenge, but it's not it's not a matter of a lack of will or a lack of vision. It's a matter of being able to borrow from Peter to play to pay Paul. And uh, and we are determined to figure out a way to do it. OK, thank you. You've heard. Sir. Can, I, can oh, I just kind absolutely. of build on what the counselor said? Because I, I really like how she phrased that. I personally or my team, we don't we don't just say, OK, I want money over here and I put money over here. Uh, the biggest challenge of my job is uh, when I go to work, which is probably 16, 17 hours of a day, not to bring my political opinion and it doesn't come to my my job, right? So most of my stuff as I highlighted there is built by either a direction or a financial plan that's been approved. Uh, I'm not using that as a scapegoat, but for those that listened into housing and planning committee yesterday, the long range financial plan for housing, the first one the city done was done in 2021. I committed to bringing back a revised plan to inform the 2024 budget. That's a big commitment from me. That's a big commitment from my team with all the stuff that we got to do this year, given we also got to deliver a 2024 budget in the next six months. We got to consider all the strategic priorities of, of this term of council. So that's my commitment to these councillors because it's important I do that refresh, even though that plan was only done two years ago, a lot of, a lot has changed. So that's why it's important to get this feedback because it resonates the importance of my commitment to get that plan done and refreshed in the next couple months. Okay, thank you very much, Cyril. That's uh, fulsome. All right, I've handed the microphone to this gentleman. If you could ask your questions succinctly, we're running running down. Right. There's quite a few more questions in the in the audience. So I will ask that people try and be as succinct as possible. 
Uh, hello, I'm Robin Brown with the 613-819 Black Hub. Um, question actually for the Sean, Lane, and uh, Teresa, and one for Cyril. So I'll ask you, ask you first so you can think about the answer while I'm asking the other one. Uh, you mentioned that money can't be taken from the OPS and put to other things, but after a big fight last year, we got $3 million cut from the budget increase, and it went to mental health, so what's up with that? Um, so, uh, Teresa, you mentioned that, that you've never voted against the police budget. Well, we're in a phase where things are happening that have never happened before, right? There's never been a full-time black paid political activist paid by your federal tax dollars, and yet here I am. So the question I have is, so the question is, will you vote against the police budget? And the reason is, is because the board has lost all legitimacy. And here are the reasons. One is in terms of limiting public delegations, they're literally, literally acting like fascists who didn't get the memo that you're not supposed to make it so obvious, right? They're moving public delegations to a separate meeting at noon for only one hour, and then they're limiting it to people who haven't spoken in the last three months, which is clearly an attack directly on me and other activists, right? It's, it's quite blatant. Two, uh, Kathy Curry is out there running around saying the police budget is decreasing. Like, they're just complete misinformation. Three, they hired a guy, Hefford Solutions, who's now been charged with forgery by us. And four, Sutcliffe said he's, he's doing a line-by-line -line audit of all city services, and I asked him on in public, I have it on video. I said, Mark, will that include the OPS? Yes. How can you throw $50 million at the police budget if you haven't finished your line-by-line -line audit? So the question again is, will you vote against the police budget? Will you do something that hasn't been done before? So maybe I'll take the question, my question first. So with all due respect, just for clarity, uh, City Council can't say today, okay, I gotta go take that money. The board kind of provides that direction to the police services. The board then recommends that budget to city council and city council can vote at that point. So just for clarification, I just want to make sure that no disrespect to me in my role. OK, so just to clarify that. So. Councillors, you want to address uh, the broad strokes of that question? Well, I'm going to be taking a look at it um, at this point. Um, I will uh, will examine it. I have supported it in the past, Robin, as you know, um, and uh, I, I take a look at each one individually. I am concerned because when the when the chief came to um, to speak to us, um, he didn't seem to have the concern for mental health that I was hoping for, and that that did concern me. So I am looking very much at at not supporting it. Um. Thank you for the question. So during my campaign this uh, summer, out of the f literally thousands of conversations I had where every conversation ended with, what's your your big issue in the ward? I can count on one hand the number of times I heard people in Ward 9 say they want more police. I've heard people, people have written to me uh, to ask for increased policing, but when I look at the data of what I heard in Ward 9 campaigning, like literally one hand, People ask me for more policing. Um, when I had my my meeting with Deputy Chief Bell uh, the other day, where he presented statistics for my ward, he was transparent and he said that in Ward Nine, crime is uh, decreasing. Uh, there is there is a it, it's bucking the trend citywide. Citywide, apparently the statistics are are increasing. Um, when I if if one of my jobs is to uh, to reflect the the concerns and needs of the ward based on the evidence that is presented to me. Um, if that is one of my jobs, and sorry, the other little bit of context, the, the most important element about public safety that was conveyed to me throughout the campaign and since is uh, public safety as manifested through uh, dangerous speeding and driving. And uh, Deputy Chief Bell admitted to me uh, two things, that speeding and traffic and dangerous driving, 24 out of 24 councillors agree that that's an issue. And he also said to me that that's not a policing issue. So based on 
based on him readily admitting that an increase in policing is not a solution to traffic, based on the fact that crime in Ward 9 is decreasing, and based on the fact that five out of thousands of people asked for more policing, I would not be supporting the police budget at this moment. I'll be asking him questions because he does have some stated needs that do frustratingly make sense. Uh, unless there were really, really, really significant amendments to the budget, I wouldn't be voting uh, in favor of it. And also in terms of what the city as a whole has identified as our true, genuine emergency priorities, um, I'm not hearing uh, an echo of chorus for policing being one of them. Housing, absolutely. Uh, policing, I'm not hearing that. That answers your question. All right, we have our next question in the back row here. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And my, I like to ask is that, um, what is the point um, in Ottawa and spending tons of billions of dollars trying to reduce carbon dioxide emissions when it is I'm not going to stop air right there. pollution and China? Hi there. We agreed. The word. Hi. You told me that your question was going to be about housing. Yes, yes. Just so, listen. So we're getting a very similar right. question to here. Can you get to your question? Okay, okay. Please? Thank you. So when when China, the world's leading emitter, has no intention to ever cap their em emissions. So um, my question is, so what's the point we spent the like uh, Ottawa and spent tons of millions of dollars to re trying to reduce the carbon like uh, emission? And those m dollars could be very well spent on Ottawa, like uh, affordable housing, police and public uh, health care. So that I echo previous lady's question about Ottawa okay, let's, affordable housing. Let's let them so, answer the question. Thank you. Yeah, what's the point? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for the question. And I am detecting a theme in the room. Uh, I appreciate that there are some positions that are are suggesting that our climate change priority is inappropriate. And I hear you and I and I appreciate you showing up today to share your views. Uh, if you would like to continue the conversation, you're more than welcome, as Tim said, to write us or to let us know in another forum. But I think it would be appropriate, given everyone who's come out today, to give some space to other kinds of issues for the night. And I say that say this with all the respect in the world, but at this point, I believe that we would really like to diversify the questions to support other people's priorities as well. So thank you, and uh, I hope we can continue to enter into this with respect for one another. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, we have a couple more questions in the virtual meeting. So Francesca, if you'd like to go and unmute. Yes, hello, good evening. Um, can you hear me? I can indeed. Great. Um, I wanted to thank you for hosting the evening. And my question is for the three councillors, but it's interesting that you, you've you uh, put a halt to the climate issue because um, I do have concerns. And, and actually, I should tell you that I was uh, a member of the Green Party for many, many years. And uh, and uh, an acquaintance of of Elizabeth May, but I'm extremely concerned about the um, industrial turbines that um, the city of Ottawa is devoting millions of dollars um, to carrying out for the climate change master plan. And I just wanted to know what you think about bringing these 710 industrial turbines that are a menace to to birds and bats and do have de you know deleterious effects on human health as well um you know and and i'm sure you can understand that as a green party um you know supporter i am very very concerned about mental health and housing and homeless people. And I just don't understand why money would be sent on, spent on these turbines when it could be better spent, you know, taking care of the populations of, of all the people in Ottawa much more effectively. And that's my question, thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Yeah, so it's been suggested also that Environment Committee is coming up on Tuesday. So they're going to be looking at these budgetary items in more specificity, which would include the uh, no, no, 
I appreciate that, but we, we don't we don't have the expertise when it comes to industrial turbines. This is something that's beyond my my understanding. I understand. I understand. So we have counselors who are devoted to this file and they are meeting on Tuesday. Excuse me, ma'am. Exactly. And I'm looking forward to hearing the results of this committee meeting for exactly that reason. I will also attend. So these individuals were assigned to this committee and they're going to be gathering to discuss the details of the budget. Delegations can be present at that committee and we can get some better answers for you, possibly through that avenue. So there's a lot of places where people can play in order to get the answers they need for these questions. I'll just quickly add, and you can always, so if, if I don't answer the question and I don't know the answer, please send an send a email through your counselor and that will come to me. I can't recall in that 1100 plus pages, I don't believe there's anything in there for turbines, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not, I'm being honest with you. Send the question through and I'll, I'm going to ask you and to I'll stop. Respond. And I'll respond. Down. This is the guy who wrote it. Exactly. So. <laughs> and if, yeah, and and to be fair, I I can't recite the eleven hundred plus pages. But I'm what I'm giving you is my commitment. Send your question to your respective counselor, and I'll respond to you. And because I don't recall the word turbine in thousands of pages that I've seen in the past three weeks. So, thank you, counselors. Uh, we have another question from the virtual meeting. So, Jim Whitaker, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, I feel I have to apologize for bringing up climate change again, but it's a I'm taking a different tack. Uh, I see that there are five million dollars uh, um, allocated to the um, implementation of the climate change master plan, uh, which seems like a small number compared to oh let's say the twenty one million for widening the airport parkway. So my question is, does the council think? The five million dollars is adequate to the task. Councillor Devine, um, it's a uh, and it's always funny when I'm hearing and I, I I don't mind the question. I don't mind all the questions, but whenever I hear uh, a question about you know why are we spending money on this when we should be spending money on this, it's it's not always a, a binary thing where it's a choice of either or. Like I, I don't hear anybody saying, why are we spending money on on fire services when we should be spending money on 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 um, on housing? Uh, with regard to the question there about is the five million dollars which is allocated towards the implementation of the um what's the name of the plan, the climate plan, is that five million dollars enough from what I hear from my colleagues on the environment committee? It's it's a nice start. Um, it might not be um, uh, as much as they had hoped, but it's certainly uh, a start for year one. When I do hear the question about comparing that expenditure towards the, the $20 million allocated in 2023 for the airport parkway, I mean, I'll be transparent. My I, I, I do have uh, significant concerns over the expenditure for the airport parkway. Just for anybody who's uh, curious, that's it's an allocation of approximately 80 million over four years um, for uh, a project that is intended to widen the airport parkway between Hunt Club and Brookfield. Um, it's a controversial project to say the least. Um, I know that a lot of people, myself included, have, have, have serious concern about it. A lot of people on council do support it. Um, but I, I find it a good question when you're saying, is, is it enough to spend this money here when you're spending that money there? Because to a certain extent, the projects are, uh, they, they combat each other. Um, one project is meant towards spending money, 5 million, towards implementing or advancing uh, a climate plan. The other project, widening a highway, is meant to serve what is being described as a transportation need. But that 20 million or 80 million over four years could easily be seen as counterproductive to our climate goals because Anytime you widen a highway, um, you're going to be inducing vehicle demand, which is not going to, you know, necessarily serve our climate needs. That said, for many people in Ottawa, that airport widening is serving a a transportation need for a growing population in the south part of the city. Uh, it's a controversial issue, that's for sure. I haven't really answered your question, but I spoke for a while. Okay, thank you, Councillor Devine. Uh, all I think right. we should be investing that money in the um, more in having a direct connection to the airport with the LRT. Yeah, that would be a better place for it. 
Yeah. And the Councilor tricky Johnson. part is, sorry, just that um, uh, the widening of the airport parkway is actually funded by development charges, which is the really tricky part. So when we pay, when growth happens, we collect money that is uh, earmarked for particular kinds of investments to pay for that growth, like roads. So with the airport parkway, to Teresa's point, um, we would not be able to take that money and go plunk it into affordable housing. It, it's not allowed. Uh, we would have to use it for roads and we would have to use it for arterial roads. And so could we make thoughtful connections about how to use it for arterial roads that support other kinds of transportation, perhaps? Um, but we do get limited in how we collect our money and then how we're able to spend it. So if you look in the big, huge budget, you can see under every capital project what part of the project is tax supported versus development charge supported. And that can give you an indication of how much discretion we really have uh, on any one particular project's funding. Okay, thank you, councillors. <laughs> question in the front no, row. My you. question is related directly to the money dedicated to the airport parkway. I understand it cannot be diverted to improve public transit, but can that money dedicated for the 2023rd budget be set aside because I think we're going to have a major problem and experience um, an emergency with regard to the LRT expensive upgrades on the wheel problem. And those are both, both related to transportation in this city. And I don't know whether that kind of a shift could be possible. Um, so I'll leave it up to you to, to help me sort that one out. No, I can jump in, but uh, I just told Councillor Johnson she gets a gold star because she's done a really good job with the budget. To her point, so so basically the challenge with the airport parkway, and it goes back to what I mentioned before, the DC background study is one of the, the documents we use when we build the budget, and the DC dollars that's collected is earmarked, a component is earmarked for roads, a component is ear, earmarked for transit. So for the airport parkway, that money has been earmarked for that road, uh, if we take that money away, it can go to another road of similarity, but we can't move it to a transit infrastructure. So we're really limited to, you know, you know, we can take the airport parkway dollars and move it over to, I'll say Green Bank as an example, if that's the council's will, uh, but we can't take that money and move it to LRT infrastructure or bus infrastructure. Councillor Johnson. If you're really excited about development charges and you want to know more, the planning department is going to be putting together a development charges primer because the province of Ontario has also changed a lot of the rules when it comes to development charges. So we're able to collect fewer. We're not able to collect them for the purposes of, of studies to understand how to do growth. We're not able to collect them now for affordable housing. We have to spend them down faster and other implications that are really gonna limit um, revenues uh, for municipalities. So they are going to put together a public uh, development charge primer sometime in the summer. So if you wanna be really nerdy with me, uh, I'll be sure to be sending that out through my communications as it comes forward. And that, uh, but I, I would encourage that because as, as daunting this is and overwhelming it is to kind of understand all this detail, I think those little sessions are important because they're a big component of how this is built. So having that little bit of understanding of that, you know, when we do all of our other financial plans and stuff, it kind of helps piece it together a level. I'm not expecting you to go down too low, but those primers are really good. Uh, sometimes I even go because these are very complex things and, they, and staff does a really good job in kind of understanding at least a perimeter of what that means. Thank you very much. All right, we have a question in the third row. I must be the only fiscal conservative in the room, but I, I want to thank you for limiting expenditures to only 2.2% increase. Uh, and I, I hope that there are a few other people in this room that are not just interested in spending more money. Um, but there, I have a question related to that. If you, given that inflation in Canada is about 6% this year, uh, and you're only proposing to increase the budget by 2.2%, that implies that you're going to have to significantly reduce your workforce. Is that your intention? So 
really good question. So I'll, I'll break it down in components. And so basically it's a 2.5% tax levy increase and 2.2% assessment growth. So that nets about 92 million from taxation. And then we have the other, like the user fees and the other funding that comes in. The one thing that we've been fortunate about when it comes to CPI. So CPI is your consumer price index. Right now it's probably at 6.7, 6.8%, largely driven by your groceries and those fundamental you know, consumer products. Fortunately, the city's in a good position where we don't buy groceries. The 48, 50% of our budget is, <laughs> is driven by salaries. Most of our collective agreements have settled for 2023 below 2%. So that's a good thing. Uh, then when you get into the other other components like our fuel, our fuel is like 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5% of the total budget. One of our biggest components of fuel is diesel. We do have a treasury department where we edge our contracts. So for 2023, our pricing is around $1.47 for diesel. So if you go to the pump down the road, you're probably paying about $1.75, $1.80 for diesel. So we have mitigations to kind of reduce that component. And then when we look at all of our other components like materials and services, there's such a small part percentage of the global budget that we're, we're able to mitigate a lot of the risk of that CPI 6%, right? And one of the challenges that we have, and it's been questioned to me at committee, we don't have a municipal indicator for, for inflation, but what we do is we look at all of our commodities and kind of break it down by component. Uh, like our natural gas, as an example, is going up by 17%. So we, we're budgeting for that. But again, the natural gas budget, you know, that percentage of the total 4.5 is so small that 17% of a smaller number is not as big. 4% uh, for water, 4.2% for water, sorry, and 4% for hydro. Uh, capital inflation is at 6.33%. So we, we do have capital inflation built into the the tax and the rate programs. So overall, we look at all these different indices, and that's how we've been able to manage largely because of the, the collective agreements that settled below 2%. But it's, it is worth noting. I mean, your question is, is, is important to me in that, from what I understand, 50% uh, or close to 50% of our expenditures uh, from the city are our payroll salary. Um, and those many of those collective agreements are set to be renewed in in two years, um, and we can't anticipate what those uh, those increases will be. But um, I would I, I share a, a bit of a concern that well, I come at it from a different way than you. But if hypothetically we stay at this course of two point five percent, and if the if the you know two years from now the collective agreements are such that the labor increase in our budget is a lot more than that, or um, and inflation if it doesn't stabilize, then yeah, it's going to put some pressures on the budget. And I I remember, I know that one thing I had been uh, considering asking at council is if we can prepare, you know, three, four years of budget scenarios that anticipate possible pressures. It may be a waste of time because so much of it is, is uncertain, but I'd like to anticipate what the risks are four years down the road, five years down the road. All right, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Dawood, can we get a couple of more questions from online? We can indeed. Uh, Bethany, or sorry, Beth, if you'd like to go ahead, you can unmute. Beth Doubt. Okay, all good. Uh, John Meyer, if you'd like to go ahead. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Can. Okay, great. First of all, I would like to thank uh, all the councillors for having this uh, public consultation. Uh, my question is for any of the councillors or the city staff. Um, has Ottawa investigated the source of raw materials uh, for the batteries for the electric buses? Because I'm concerned because um, I'm concerned how it's uh, secured because um, according to a report by Amnesty International, um, there are a lot of human rights abuses in the Congo, uh, which is powering a global trade in a cobalt, which is needed in electric batteries. Councillor, anyone? Oh, we've got some uh, Googling going on at the moment. <laughs> I had that question directed to me from a, from a constituent the other day, and I did get an answer from 
the city on that. If the question is on the ethical mining of of batteries for uh, for electric buses, if you give me a second. But oh, um, tell you what, let's get to another question. I'll find the answer. I have it. It's just going to take me a minute. All right, we'll place that question on hold for a moment. OK, one more from online. OK, GT dot Fiori, if you'd like to go ahead. Oh, wait, sorry. Jerry Fiori. OK, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm sure the question I have is, um, you know, uh, Councillor uh, Johnson talked about uh, you, there's always a trade off between, you know, if we're going to add something to one, you have to take it from some other other place and which is, uh, you know, a, a good thing for some parts, but you now have um, a 2.2% growth in revenues coming into you, which haven't been earmarked to anything. You know, so why isn't there 2.2% of the budget fully open to go to the, your priorities? And that is, I'm really confused by that. Uh, if you can give me an answer to that. Yeah, so the 2.2% the is earmarked for the overall budget. So again, the 2.5% tax levy increase and the 2.2% assessment growth on the tax bill, that brings in about $92 million combined additional taxation revenue for 2023 and all that revenue is allocated throughout the budget documents to the various initiatives pressures that's detailed in that budget so it is fully allocated all right does that sufficiently answer your question i think i might have muted him ah there you go Hopefully all right and we got the other Questioner back. Oh, do you want to provide your answer to the uh, other question? So for the uh, the person who asked the question earlier about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 ethical mining of batteries for electric buses. So I got that question, like I said, from a constituent. I got an answer from someone at OC Transpo. I'll read the answer. Uh, the procurement of OC Transpo's current electric buses were in accordance with the city's general terms and conditions, which includes ethical purchasing to ensure minimum labor standards and prohibits child labor or forced labor. Furthermore, future, procure, future procurements of buses will also ensure that ethical purchasing, including prohibiting child labor or forced labor, is considered into any resulting awards of contract. Additionally, our existing electric bus batteries are manufactured by Exalt Energy, which confirms conflict-free mineral sourcing. Future electric bus procur procurements will also ensure that batteries are from conflict-free mineral sourcing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, we have one more. We're going to take one more question from the audience. We're running up against the wall. We're going to take one more question from online. Then we're going to talk a bit more about uh, alternative methods for getting your your views in. OK, so we have a question right here. We really fill out the spot now. I hope it's a good last question or second last it's question. It's going to be spectacular, <laughs> I'm sure of it. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to bring it back to like hyper local if I if I can for a moment. Um, it's an economic development question. So I saw in the budget there's one hundred and three million dollars. If my glasses are serving me right, that's allocated to economic development. Um, and you're in a little bit of a circle that I used to find myself in at the college where they were balancing their budget on international student fees. And then suddenly country said you can't come pandemic big budget mess. Um, the city relies a lot on those development charges, which is density, dense, 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 dense stuff. Uh, so when I look down baseline and I look at all the development applications, five towers over here, three towers over there, Scouts Canada wants to replace their building with three more towers, 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 towers. Doesn't drive economic activity. College Ward feels a little bit like a bedroom community. If people are familiar with that term, it's a good place to go to be a student. There's great schools here. Uh, it's a great place to retire. It's really hard to work in the riding. It's really hard to commute in the riding. Is there any influence that you have in how those budget pieces can be allocated to drive actual business growth, employment opportunities, new labor things? Councillor Jones. Hello. Uh, so yes, that's an excellent question. And it's funny, I was actually online with um, uh, 
a proposed development uh, in the ward today, and it is it is one single tower. And I was asking the question, you know, why are we not uh, making this a, a more visionary conversation where we're taking uh, uh, a more district-like approach to that kind of development? Um, so I am sending signals that that's the type of approach I'd like to take. Um, we 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 have a couple challenges in that baseline has been designated as a transit oriented development strip so we're getting the density for a transit system that doesn't that doesn't yet exist nor is actually funded so in the 2023 draft budget um, and through 2024 we will be seeing some traffic priority signals starting to happen at the most westerly end of baseline because that's a part of the phase or that's the only phase that's affordable for the city of ottawa then there's uh, a $400 million price tag for the actual infrastructure where we get buses, the stations. And, and doing that will help to bring that local tourism, that ease of movement that can help. There's also great opportunity with the transit-oriented development that's happening around the stations. So um, I'm really encouraged by... Uh, the IRIS secondary plan. So the IRIS secondary plan also includes the IKEA parcel, which is up for sale. I don't know if it's been purchased yet. Has it been purchased yet? Anyone on this call know? No, I don't. I don't know. I, I haven't been notified of that. But they are trying to take a sort of district-like approach for um, uh, designing for that land, so that you can have the amenities, the park, the transit um, connections to the north. So I'm encouraged by that. I'm also really excited for Bell's Corners because Bell's Corners has all the bones of a really excellent main street. Uh, if you've driven down Robertson Road, you may not necessarily feel like it's built for people because it is uh, four lanes in either direction, but it is probably the closest we've got with the most opportunity because, again, a lot of uh, parking space or parking lots that could be intensified, but also Greenfield is happening there with um, Stillwater Station, which is going to effectively double the population. So there's going to be good money coming into Bell's Corners through that development that could really, uh, and it's the only BIA that we actually have in the ward as well, and BIAs are really exciting. Um, they pay a, t a levy on their property taxes, these um, uh, these businesses that get reinvested into the local community. I know Sean and I are trying to investigate what it might take to support Merivale to uh, adopt a BIA and raise some income to invest in uh, the beautification. But we're also going to have a baseline secondary plan in this term of council and likely also a Merivale secondary plan in this term of council, which is going to try and take a district-like approach to development, which will really help to increase the walkability and support local business. So there are a lot of things coming. There's a lot of really good will for College Ward right now. People are really excited to work together. And uh, if you have any other questions or any other ideas, please don't hesitate to reach out. Hey, thank you very much for the question. All right, one last question from online. Indeed, Susan Flynn, if you'd like to go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, my question is about the, um, the buses and the capital uh, cuts that are coming to the buses. I'm wondering how council can vote when we don't know what those cuts actually mean in terms of service. I believe the questioner is asking about the identified efficiencies. Well, no, yeah. it's the Are 52 million. Yeah. It's the 52 million dollars that's being cut from the capital budget that um, capital, sorry, the 52 million capital, capital budget commission for buses. I know it's being cut, but I've asked Council Kavanaugh, and she, nobody knows yet what those cuts are going to mean in terms of bus service for the next few years. So I'd really like to know if you know anything that hasn't been made public or how Council is going to address that if they are at the, at the voting for the budget. You know, Councillor Kevin, uh, can we start with Cyril Rogers just to clarify the numbers and then perhaps get the councillors to address the, the political substance of the question? Yeah, so there's actually some good detail in what we call the transmittal report, which is a report we table with the budget. And the breakdown of that that savings, which is reinvested in, in transit, there's 117 buses that we're taking off and not replacing. 
in 2019 uh, and 2020 when when light rail stage one line went live we held those buses in our inventory uh, these buses now are beyond their end of life they're not uh, financially worth investing in repairing no longer no neither are they no longer needed because we know that the ridership is not coming back this year so the the ridership in 2022 i think ended around 60 percent i believe now that we know that the federal government is you know they're progressing towards that hybrid work environment the projection for 2023 is 70 percent so those additional buses that were held back we're not replacing them we're, we're getting rid of them they're old they need to go uh, the other component is we looked at all of our capital program, the transit system as a, a very large capital program. There's been some delays in 2021, 2022 spending. So the way we, we budget for our capital program is, uh, I'm just trying to think of a quick example. If we were to go out and replace Constellation Road, as an example, and that's a $20 million project, we need that authority in this year so we can go and tender entering the contracts that spending will likely not not start until late in 23 ongoing spending in 24 25 so that 20 million would be spent over multiple years in a program like transit where they have annual renewal type programs there's a little bit of a backlog in terms of our spending so we've been able to take a little bit of a pause and kind of reduce the need for 2023 uh, now having said that Transit is also committed to doing a review of the entire system. Uh, the demands have changed. The, the system it need itself has changed. When a lot of people are riding transit are staying in their communities. So, you know, the people in Canada, they work from home. They're not using this, the bus as much, but there's a different need for people in this ward or the next ward. So transit is well underway in doing a review and then that will come back and, and inform the 2024 budget. So. Hopefully that kind of gives you a nuance and you can top me up, Councillor, if you want. Yeah, thank you. And um, as we look at um, what's, what's going to happen with the buses, and we know that commuters are are not going back in droves. They're they're trying to induce them to go back. But um, but one thing we have to watch is is people that use the buses for other things. And and that's I have a lot of that in uh, Bay Ward because we have a high number of seniors. We have the most seniors in the city, and they use the bus to get their groceries, go to appointments, etc. So we need good routes for them, and we need to keep those strong. So that's one thing that I, I've worked on. In fact, uh, the number eleven route, we we got it reinstated because um, it had been cut. And it was proven to be problematic for a lot of people who were going shopping, et cetera. And so we incorporated it back. Those are the kinds of things that we have to do to make sure it serves uh, constituents. So can I do a follow up and say the 52 million is mostly the buses that are not going to be replaced in any way. So they're able to free that money up to go into the budget, back into the budget to help balance it. What does that mean in terms of um, the service level? Because the service level, as you know, one of our early callers said, is already not there. there, there yeah, there's been problems with the service. There's no doubt about it. Reliability has been a problem. And when um, OC Transpo has been asked about that, I mean, I know that, like, for example, if the train breaks down and they use the R1 service, they pull buses off and they use it. Um, as well, they, uh, there's a, there is absenteeism for, for drivers. There's a shortage of drivers. I know these are all factors, but we need to know when the bus is coming. People need to know when it's going to be there so they're not standing there waiting for a bus that never showed up. We need reliability. All right. Thank you. It was a good, solid round of questions, and I'm sure there will be more. I'm sure you do have more. Uh, as you've been reminded a few times through the night tonight, the door is open for your questions. You can get in contact with any of your counselors. Uh, you can get in contact with any of your counselors. You can uh, email your questions and obviously we'll try and get you the best answers we can. Um, there are other ways to provide input uh, and Dawood is gonna talk to you a little bit about a survey that's been prepared for the budget process. Yep, so uh, what you have on screen here is a QR code. If you pull out your phones and Oh, can you not hear me? If you pull out your phones and face them towards the front screen, 
um, you should be able, it should pop up on your phone a, uh, a link, which will be a very quick form, no more than 10 minutes, if you wouldn't mind filling that out. Um, it just allows the counselors to gauge your priorities, gauge your interest, um, so we can understand where, how better to allocate the budget so it reflects your concerns and your values uh, in your different wards and throughout the city. So if you can pull out your phone, uh, and for the people uh, joining virtually, I'm going to send the link in the chat briefly. Um, and if you don't have access to a phone or you don't have access to internet, there is free internet here. But if you can't access that, we do have a couple very limited amount of paper copies. So um, if you require that, give me a couple of minutes and then raise your hand and I'll hand those out to you. Um, OK, my colleague here will hand them out to you right now. And okay. Oh, actually, for the people online, the um, screen shared QR code should work as well. I'm going to send the link just in case it doesn't. Um, so just check the monitor the chat in a couple seconds. If you guys did have questions that weren't answered throughout this evening, please write them down. There is a section on the back of the form if you're answering it physically, and there is a section online as well um, where you can add any questions, comments, concerns. So please feel free to utilize that um, so we can we can better gauge your uh, your views and your values. Thank you very much. So when you're done, if you're filling out one of the paper forms, uh, just raise your hand. I'll come grab it from you or you. Yeah, just actually I'll come grab it from you. Just wave me over. Thank you for attending tonight. Uh, very much appreciate your engagement and participation and your questions. Uh, we will obviously linger for a few minutes afterwards, but we will uh, need to clear out of the room uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Thank you again for coming out tonight. Your participation is very much appreciated. And one final point, if you guys have any questions, any concerns, all three of the counselors here are very accessible by email, by phone, by social media. So feel free, feel free to reach out to any of them. Thank you.